Hi, this is Regeline Sabah, also known as G. You're listening to Walk With Me podcast. My guests today are James Laster and Eric Hudson. Today, we will discuss financial programs that can benefit everyone in the financial times of today and how to protect your investments and have financial growth, even during these pandemic times. Welcome to the show, James and Eric. Hello, and of course, Eric. How are you doing? <laughs> Welcome. Man, welcome. It's, it's, it's a beautiful day. I, I don't know where you're at, um, but where I'm at, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Uh, I can't say enough. Um, it was snowing uh, where, where I was at. And so decided to take a sabbatical and take the family to the beach. And oh, my God, <laughs> best <laughs> business decision of 2021 right now. <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Now, James, for the audience, can you go ahead and start off by telling us a little bit more about you and where you are from? Oh, sure. James Laster, um, master financial planner, uh, born and raised in Wilmington, North Carolina. I went to the same high school as Michael Jordan, uh, transferred, I mean, then went on to North Carolina Central University, uh, graduated uh, two degrees and uh, a minor in contract law. So, uh, my background in North Carolina, then moving up to Northern Virginia, uh, what, maybe what, 14, 15 years after the fact, here I am. I love it. Now, today we're going to have a wealth discussion, and I want to start off by asking you, what are some steps people can take to reduce the fear of finance through education? Oh, great question. Um, that's actually a company model, right? Um, whereas many people are looking to be sold something, what we do that's different is we're constantly educating folks and empowering them. And if you want to talk about a first step, one of the first steps is uh, imagine if you had a healthcare adversity, whatever it may be, no matter how big or how small, what are you, what are most people going to go do? They're going to go to the doctor. Then what is the doctor going to do? They're going to do a full body assessment from head to toe. So financially, that's what everyone needs to do, right? It's a financial audit. And if you can't audit yourself personally in 48 to 72 hours, if you can't find every single document, every single proof of, of uh, or documentation that you have of every single asset, everything of your assets and liability, if you can't do that in 48 to 72 hours, Imagine what it will be like if you went through the healthcare adversity on your own or your spouse had to deal with it or your kids had to deal with it. So the very first thing to do is do uh, an audit of your entire financial, uh, your entire financial picture. And what we do um, uh, at no cost to it, definitely anybody who's listening in right now, you can go to lasterfinancial.com. You can have access to our financial GPS, answer those six questions. And there you can start being able to audit your financial picture. There you're able to uh, start budgeting, looking at your expenses. Now, that's the biggest thing. That if we had to say number one was audit your financials, number two would be look at your expenses. You see, I work with a lot of people day in and day out. And you know what I find out? They can tell me their salary. They can tell me their net worth. They can tell me what kind of car they have. They cannot tell me down to the penny their expenses. And the fact that people are just swiping their cards day in, day out, they really don't know. But what if you knew? And what if that can help you not only now, but down the road? So that's what everyone should do is a financial audit, use your financial GPS. Very powerful. Now, how important is cash flow management and how to grow their wealth like the banks do? How can oh. people do that? So let's, uh, let's, let's just simplify it of cash flow management. Let's just simply simplify it so that you can get the big picture. So most people, when they get paid, let's say you get paid on Wednesday, the direct deposit comes in, but on Thursday, what are you doing? You're spending, you're paying everybody else, right? And then most people save after they save what's left. They save the scraps, like they're little rats or something, right? Well, here's the difference. This is the difference what the banks do. When you give the banks your money, you are a loaner. Now, you can go to the FDIC website and, and, and fact check me on this, but you're literally loaning the banks your money. And if you're loaning the banks your money, then everything else that I'm getting ready to tell you is basically 
what makes it tax free, tax deferred, what makes it possible, what makes it legal. So when you give the banks your money, the banks take your money and they give it to the Federal Reserve. When they give your money to the Federal Reserve, what happens? The Federal Reserve then returns that money back to the banks on a 10 to 1 ratio, saying that you only uh, the banks only need to keep that 10 percent that you originally loaned them inside the bank. God forbid you want to zero out your account. What is the bank doing with that other 90 percent that you can be doing? And what is the bank doing with that mandatory 10 percent that you can be doing as well? Well, here's the difference. The banks have a way of accumulating wealth in that amount of money that you're using. So you got to think about in the back of your mind, how are you optimizing the use of annuities and life insurance inside your own portfolio? That's what the banks are doing. They have well over $21 trillion. So that's what we're talking about, cash flow management. How can you get money back on every single dollar you spend? Kind of like your own personal credit card company, right? How can you get money back? Right. And what about if you're paying your mortgage? How can you get three to seven percent back on all of your car payments, your mortgage payments? If you understand how the banks are managing their cash flow and then you adapt just one behavior, flowing your money through your annuity or through your life insurance policy so they can be indexed and you start growing money. Boom. That's it. I love it. Now, how important is business structuring? Oh, my goodness. It's amazing to me. Um, I was just talking last week uh, to a husband and wife uh, business duo. And the wife had a business and the husband had a business. And we're talking about what's been made available now. What is, you know, what's Congress talking about, right? And the interesting fact is I said, hey, are you C Corp? Are you S Corp? Are you LLC? And you know, the husband was LLC and uh, the wife was S corporations. Well, business structuring matters, folks. Listen, if you have an LLC or S corp or, or, or LLP or, 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 you know, they say sole proprietor, guess what? Those are passed through entities and those pass through entities are passing through to what? Your social security number. So if it's passing through to your social security number, guess what that means? You're overwhelmingly paying more in taxes. Are you properly structured? And you can go to your CPA and your accountant and say, hey, if I was an LLC uh, versus an S Corp, how much in taxes would I be paying? If I was an LLC, S Corp or a C Corporation, how much in taxes would I be paying? And there's your answer. It's the difference in how much you are paying in taxes. And it's not only what you're earning, it's what you get to keep, right? And taxes are always going to be your biggest expense. So how do you minimize your biggest expense? Is by properly structuring your business. The last thing I'll throw out in there. You don't only want to just structure your business. The other thing that you want to do is make sure that you're properly flowing your money through your business. Once again, because it's not what you earn, it's what you get to keep. So we're constantly encouraging our clients to, to, to stretch the envelope, if you will, on what they think they know. Because here's the biggest question. If what you knew to be true turned out not to be true, when would you want to know? So that's kind of how we lead into that, that structuring part, uh, even with families, even with your personal state, even with business owners, right? That's about it. Very powerful. Now, how important is it for an individual to obtain a licensed financial consultant to assist them with their finances? Oh, I say this from a position of strength where I've had numerous clients you know, work with me and I'm picking up where someone else left off. And it's not to say that, um, you know, pitting one advisor against another, but here's the deal. I am a holistic planner, right? And so if you are just working with your wealth uh, management company, well, they know how to grow your money in the stocks and bonds, right? If you have an advisor, they're probably just pitching you some type of financial product, insurance or annuities or, you know, right? But if you have a holistic planner like myself, we're talking, we're taking into consideration what products that you have, but we start with your lifestyle first. What type of lifestyle are you trying to get or trying to protect? And I think we can understand your lifestyle. Now we're talking about, okay, what type of results are you going to need to be able to do actually what you want to protect and the lifestyle you're trying to achieve? And if we do that, we know what type of products that, that, you know, what type of products that you should have. So understanding that plus the taxes, Medicare, Social Security, E-State, business succession, putting it all in together in one unified plan makes the difference of why somebody should seek out a licensed professional. Because 
wealth management is not a DIY project. Thank you, James. Thank you for sharing that with us. I appreciate you. Now, welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us. You're muted. <laughs> Let's go ahead and unmute that mic. Yeah. You let us know when you're unmuted, Eric. But I do have another question for James here. So James, let's say for example, an individual feels stuck in regards to their finances. What are some steps they can take to get unstuck? To get unstuck, it, here's, it, it seems pretty basic, but I, I'll say this right here. First and foremost, first and foremost, that audit is really important. You got to audit your finances. But number two, you can't spend everything you earn. You can't spend what you don't have, right? And that's that. That's the debt trick that a lot of people are getting in. But here's the other thing. Understanding debt, right? What I try to do is I try to change people's perspective on debt. Most people say, okay, I'm going to get a 30-year mortgage, and then I'll figure it out in 30 years. What if you actually knew when you were actually going to be out of debt, when that house was actually, no matter what, was going to be paid off? Then you didn't, you know, you, it's not a stress, right? If people can do that, that's number one. Number two is the debt. But number, you know, number two, you can't spend everything you get. But number three, when you bring it all together and you have a plan, and you stick to your plan, just like going to the doctor, just like going to the gym. If you have a plan, you're going to be better off than 90% of the country because statistics says 87% of the country does not have a plan and has less than $25,000 saved for retirement. Very powerful. Thank you, James. Thank you. Welcome, Eric. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome guy. Oh yeah, man. <laughs> yes. Great conversation going on. Yes, sir. Now, can you go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience, Eric? Yes, for sure. Uh, uh, Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Hudson. I am a owner and operator of a registered investment advisory firm. In the nutshell, it's a firm that specializes in managing client investments in the financial markets and uh, through a systematic quantitative investment approach. And I have a, a just the long and short of it. I'm originally from Chicago, I spent a few years in the army and a uh, Worked in the private sector for several years, uh, studied business management in undergrad, uh, got an MBA in finance, currently pursuing a PhD in finance, and I'm completely obsessed with investing in the financial markets. And my whole premise and mission is about building generational wealth. Uh, same thing with James. James and I had a really good conversation. Uh, thanks to you, Reginald, for linking us up. James and I had a really good discussion on uh, a, a, another show that I had going on. So and that's pretty much me in, in a nutshell. I love it. Now, Yolanda says, I had to jump on this conversation. Always curious to learn about financial planning and management. And Melanie X says, hello, team. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. And before we get to the questions in regards to the questions Eric will be answering, Yolanda has a question for James here. James, please share with us which are good and bad debts to have. <laughs> uh the debts that you do not have any idea of the payoff date or when you're going to be able to pay that off, those are bad debts. Now, let's dig deeper. Some people will say a house is not bad debt, right? And then they will even convince you and say, hey, um, you should uh, uh, get a house so you can have the tax write-off. So, so let's just use the house because um, we're, we're talking about good debts and bad debts, just really briefly. Well, you have to take in consideration the tax laws, what, what are available right now, right? So the standard deduction has been increased, so nobody's really taking an itemized deduction, and the itemized deduction is that right there is where you're getting your, uh, your, your tax break, right? Well, nobody's itemizing anymore, okay? So what's the purpose of having a house, right? That's why we have a program entitled a five-year mortgage. We show you how to pay your mortgage off in five years. Why? Because I don't believe having any debt is good debt. We should not be indebted to anyone except but for love, right? What about a credit card, right? Credit cards, oh my God, I, I don't like them, but you need them for today's market. Make sure you pay that off in 30 days. So good debt, 
versus bad debt, hey, debt is debt, right? Debt is debt. And you can't retire with any type of debt, any type of debt. And guess what? The other uh, Here's another bad debt. What, what's bad debt to me? Taxes are bad debt. <laughs> so if you have a big old 401k account and you think you have a million dollars, no, 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 mama. You got only $700,000, right? Because tax is a debt. Absolutely amazing. Thank you, James. Now, Eric, how important is it to invest in the financial markets? I would say that it's, it's a, how important is it? That's a good question. I would say, uh, I think that everyone should have at least some exposure of their wealth, their investments into the financial markets because historically, Economically, from an economic perspective, uh, most of the wealth in this country has been built by way of investing in the financial markets, in the stock market. Uh, you just do a quick Google search and, and you look at the history of wealth accumulation over the history in the United States. Uh, most of it has been accumulated in the financial markets. So I'm not saying, you know, it, it, it always depends on a case by case situation in terms of what percentage of your wealth should be allocated into into the financial markets? But I just to throw a rough number out there, you know, I'll say on average at least ten percent. Ten percent of your overall wealth is probably a good number to aim for. You know, it, if majority of your wealth and if majority of your wealth and is in a different area such as real estate or franchise businesses or some other type of assets, investments that you have going on, it's always good to have some some exposure into the financial markets because you, you want to have a piece of American business. You know, American business has stood the test of time. And basically, investing in the financial markets, we own stocks and bonds and exchange traded funds and things like that. You know, we have to remember that you're, own, you're, you're a, a owner those are shares of ownership of these businesses. And again, you know, unless the end of the world is coming, I believe from a long term standpoint, American business is going to continue to stand the test of time. And so that's why it's important to have a piece of that pie, you know, within your portfolio in some shape or fashion. Absolutely. I love it. Now, talk to us about some of the stigmas that are around investing in the financial markets and what are some steps people can take to shift their mindset to a positive mindset when it comes to investing? Hmm. Some of the stigmas, uh, I, I would say, uh, come to mind in terms of some of the stigmas. I think there's uh, some fear that comes with it. And this is just from my personal experience with running my practice and when I'm speaking with a new prospective client, uh, it's very common for them to come forward and say, you know, I've, I've had a fear of investing in the financial markets or I didn't think I had enough money. That's a really big one. You know, so I want to I want to be very clear to clear up that stigma. You know, uh, number one, you can open up a brokerage account with fifty dollars with it, it with you know some of the mainstream brokers such as your trial swap your your fidelity e-trade so on and so forth and so that number one it is it's never too late to get started with any amount that you have and the sooner you get started the better so i wanted to destroy the sigma of not having enough money and the other thing, you know, I think uh, from my experience, people also had the stigma of underestimating the level of skill that's required to have long term success with investing in the financial markets. For example, uh, one another stigma that stands out that I come across very commonly is uh, I come across guys who call themselves day traders or just in casual conversation they'll say oh i i made this i made you know 
five thousand dollars today in the stock markets or something like that. And I always get them stumped with this one question. I'll ask the question. I say, uh, number one, how long have you been invested in the markets? How many years do you have in the game? And then, you know, they may throw out an arbitrary number, like three years, five years, for example. And then I'll say, okay, well, what is your compounded annualized return over that over that three to five year period? And for some reason, they always get stumped. They can't they can't spit out their track record. Their, their history, their performance. And so like some of the shenanigans we've seen going on lately in the stock market, like with the, the GameStop situation, the AMC situation. Uh, so just to uh, wrap this up in terms of stigma, I think that, that there's two extremes of the spectrum. I talked about the fear-based side of it. Now I'm talking about the overconfident side of it. I just want to remind people that investing in the financial markets is a discipline just like any other discipline. You know, it, it's a discipline just like uh, a medical doctor who spent four years in grad school and then another four years in residency. It, it's a discipline just like uh, an attorney. It's a discipline just like a, a, uh, a clinical psychologist. Investing in the stock market is no different. It's, it's serious business. And you know, I, I take my discipline very seriously. I put a lot of time into it, a lot, a lot of study and ongoing education into it, a lot of practice. And those that have a long track record of success, some of the big names out there is no different. And so when it comes to those stigmas, those, dude, those are two of, the, two of the extremes when it comes to that. So, I definitely agree. And discipline truly matters. James, do you have anything you want to chime in on that? Yeah. So take everything that we just heard. And I'll give you two examples. I have one client, she worked at Costco for 17 years, was going through a divorce. And when she came into my office, guess what? Costco worker had well over a million dollars saved in her 401k account. She was working with an Eric Hudson type of person that managed all of her affairs. And so she educated herself over that period of time and she was able to look at the news and say, okay, my accountants were doing good. If they're not doing good, hey, Eric, what do we need to do? All right, having that type of conversation. Whereas I have another client that just called me uh, last week on Friday. He got he had a sinus infection, whatever he was doing, he lost about 400K. So it's a discipline. Everything Eric is telling you is, is about having that discipline and ongoing education, ongoing learning so that you are inept of what's going on. I love it. Now, James, Yolanda says, thanks for that, James. I would love to hear more about your mortgage payment program. How do we get in contact with you? Uh, email us at james at Laster Financial. Um, or yeah, if you just go there, I, I or one of my assistants to get back to you. Uh, but this program is only good for a year and we're trying to help as many people as we can during this pandemic time, whatever. Um, and it's just a program to definitely help people, uh, pay off their homes quicker. If you're refinancing, whatever the situation is, we want you debt free so that you can start really doing what you need to do to improve the status of our country. So that's what this is all about. Uh, it's very military friendly, essential worker friendly, uh, but it doesn't matter who you are. It's, it's a super simple program. I don't want to use now to, to do that, but just reach out James at Laster Financial. I love the fact that you said that you assist veterans as well. Now, Eric, you being a veteran, do you see a pattern in regards to those individuals needing to get out of debt as well? Yes. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Talk to Lane, us. Let, let me tell you, when I I, de I deployed to Afghanistan, right? And so I, I'm in a, the army as, as an officer. So, you know, I came in with, with a little bit of rank, nothing major, but I, I, I had a lot of I had a lot of soldiers, a lot of young soldiers who, and I'll just be honest, you know, a lot of people, at least from my experience uh, in the army, they, they come from, you know, less than pristine backgrounds. And a lot of them have come to the military as kind of a, a way to escape their situation back home. And, and so when you deploy, aside from, you know, fighting for your country, right? 
financially, you're over there. Uh, everything your pay is completely tax free. Your room and board is completely covered. You don't have to worry about food, clothing, all the basic necessities are all covered. So your 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 typical expenses that you would have stateside as an everyday citizen, when you're deployed somewhere or you're abroad somewhere in the military, those expenses go away. And then you, you compound that with all of your pay is all of a sudden tax free and, and also uh, combat pay and hazardous pay on top of all of that. Usually, if you do a decent amount of time from a deployment, you come back home, you 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 stacked up a pretty good amount of change. And I can't tell you how many times I will see, you know, we get back and, you know, they're buying up new cars and all of these expensive things and just just blowing through it, just blowing through it. And so and. <sighs> at least for the army, I can speak specifically for the army. Uh, there's definitely a need for financial education, financial counseling, financial consulting, advisement in the army. Uh, it, that, that was a, you know, a, a lack of that during my time. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the passion projects that I'm working on, on my end behind the scenes. But Yes, absolutely. You know, James hit it right on the head. There's definitely a big demand and a big need. I think it's on us to take better care of our service members financially because you, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. You know, if, if I know similar to James and you, Gigi, and, and a lot of people out there, we don't receive this financial education in our households. You know, most of us don't. And that's just the reality of it. And then secondly, most of us don't receive any type of financial education in school, in grade school, and so on and so forth. And, you know, it, it, we, we do our service members a disservice by not providing them with the abundance and abundance of tools, not the bare minimum. Because I've said in a couple of, you know, so-called, you know, financial courses during my stint in the Army, but it was very few and far in between. Nothing stuck. It was really just a check the box item for the soldiers. And it it, it, it wasn't taken seriously. It, it wasn't any programs that really stuck. And wh where you have one-on-ones, what they need is one-on-one -on -one sessions because everybody's financial situation is different. So yes, there's definitely a big need for financial education and training and guidance in our military, for sure. I love it. So, so when you're talking about our, our armed services, Right. A lot of time, if it doesn't come down from their SO, if it's not approved, then they don't know that other people like Eric exist and don't know how to reach out to them. So many of those folks, when they get their funds, it's transferred over to uh, their thrift savings plan. Right. And so they have their military pay and then maybe they have a federal job and they have their federal pay. How does that all line in together? What does that mean for their medical benefits? Many military people don't understand that, yes, the military is taking care of you while you're deployed. But after you're retired military, unless you're 100 percent disabled, all of those benefits are not there for you. What about your wives when they go to go to retire? Do Is their wives getting a 50 percent survivorship, 100 percent survivorship? 25% survivorship? Well, all of those are, are available. What do most servicemen do? They give their, their spouses 0% survivorship because they want a larger check, right? What does that mean for their long-term care? They don't think about that. They don't say that. If you are in the military and you're receiving combat pay or whatever, stash it, 80-20. Just take 20% of it and stash it. If you're not doing that, you're doing a disservice to yourself. If you have a mortgage, there are programs that the military has set up for you for you to quickly pay your mortgages off quickly. You got to do that and you got to sit down with somebody that knows. My last point, when folks like me are attempting to do different types of webinars, now I've been at McGuire Medical Base. I've been all up and down Northern Virginia and uh, uh, Missouri and so forth. Unless you know somebody, they don't get to bring the true professionals in. It's always cherry pick, right? Go get yourself some actual financial guidance to put you in the right spot. Very powerful. Thank you, James. Now, Eric, Yolanda asks, 
how do we con cultivate the minds of our people to understand and adopt wealth generation mindset? What are the easy and actionable steps? That's an interesting question, Yolanda. How do we cultivate the minds of our people to understand and adopt the generational, the wealth generation mindset? What are some easy and actionable steps? First and foremost, and you know, just speaking from experience, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to impose your beliefs on others when they're not there yet. The best way to go about it, without a doubt, is to lead by example. So you start by, Yolanda, by you yourself adopting the mindset of generational wealth and you take you taking those actionable steps to work save invest and repeat and you do that through examples and through your examples and through your actions uh, by living below your means by paying down your high interest rate debts by teaming up with experts on you know mortgage payment plans such as james by teaming up with uh, experts on keeping your mental health in order with you know uh, people that has been through it and specialize in these areas like regaline sabat by teaming up with experts who specialize in the discipline of investing in the financial markets such as myself build a very strong prominent team around yourself and you don't have to have a big pot of money to get started start small start exactly where you are and one step at a time brick by brick lead by example and the more your promises your prominence begins to show by example the people around you especially those closest to you are going to start taking notice there's been several times where you know family members of mine just, just recently I, earlier this week a family member that i haven't you know seen in probably over a year they reached out to me and said hey i've been thinking about this for a while i was very hesitant and fearful to reach out to you i was supposed to some other people they keep saying eric talk to eric and i finally worked up the cover the courage to reach out to you that's happened that happens from time to time in my family and every time it happens it just fills up fills my spirit with joy because i can talk to him blue in this in the face trying to impose my generational wealth beliefs on my lineage and it doesn't go anywhere but what happens is they see how i move they see me building a business they see my content they see my consistency my consistency first and foremost i think that's number one. I'm not only constantly preaching about generational wealth, but I'm living by example. And then those who, you know, it, all it takes is someone just to, to ask the question, hey, Eric, what is this generational stuff about? What is this investment stuff about? Then that gives me the green light to go all in. But until I, I get that, until they pop the question, you know, back to Yolanda's question, until they pop the question, at least from my experience, it's, it's almost, you know, uh, futile to attempt to impose your beliefs on others. They have to want it for themselves first and foremost. And the best thing you can do, Yolanda, is to begin by leading by example. I love it. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Now, this question is for you as well. How can an individual know when they are ready to invest in the financial markets? And if an individual is not ready, what type of road should that individual go down to prepare themselves for financial markets? Okay, good question. A couple of things. Uh, number one, you want to be in a position where you're not living check to check. You want to have a cushion built in, an emergency fund somewhere stashed away in the form of a savings account or in the form of some type of asset holding that's very liquid that can be quickly converted into cash in the event of an emergency. And the reason why you want to be positioned in that manner is because the whole premise of 
investing in a financial markets is to take advantage of one of the best creations ever, which is called compound interest. And the way compound interest works is that your investment portfolio continues to build upon itself year over year by way of compound interest. And so the more, the longer your time horizon is in the financial markets, the better you are off you will be in the long term. So you don't want to ever be in a situation where the car breaks down or the water heater breaks down and you have to pull money from your investment portfolio to take care of that. Cause then that, that you're just at that point, you're, you're running in circles and you completely going against the, the whole strategy of investing in the financial markets. So number one, you want to be in a position where you're not living check to check. Number two, I would say, uh, you want to make sure that you have your highest interest rate, high interest rate debts paid, paid off such as credit cards, payday loans, retail store cards, things like that, because those type of financial products tend to run in a range of 20 to 25 plus percent interest rate if you don't completely pay your balance off each month. And that will absolutely erode any potential investment returns that you will reap in the financial markets. So have your highest interest rates debt. Ideally, you want, you want to be debt free, but uh, I don't think you should let that stop you from going ahead and get started investing, but you do want to have your highest interest rate debt paid off. And then thirdly, uh, get, get with someone that you trust, get with someone who specializes in the discipline. Unless you have the commitment and, and we James touched on this as well a little while ago. If you don't have, you know, investing in the financial markets, like I said, I can't emphasize this enough. It's just, it's just as serious of a discipline as any other discipline. And I don't knock the do-it-yourselfers, but if you do do it yourself, you fully commit yourself to the study, uh, taking the courses that you need to take, going through the training that you need to go through, and practicing this discipline consistently because you would be better off in the long run. Uh, it's not a casino. Uh, I don't prescribe day trading. You know, it's, 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 it's a serious business where you're, you're, you're accumulating ownership of real businesses that exist in real life. So if you're going to do it yourself, be committed to learning the discipline. If not, if you already have a lifestyle going, you have a discipline in a different field, you have a family to care for and so on and so forth that doesn't fit your lifestyle to allocate the time and resources to learn that discipline, then I absolutely suggest enlisting someone who has an established track record and someone that you trust to partner with and, you know, start small. You, you don't have to, you know, put all your eggs in one basket. Start with, you know, maybe roughly five, 10 percent of your overall wealth your overall assets, you know, and then get one year under your belt. And as your comfort level starts to grow in terms of being exposed to the financial markets, hopefully you you, you can partner with someone who has the heart of a teacher. Uh, James and I talked about this uh, the other week, but hopefully you can partner with someone who has the heart of a teacher who will have patience, number one, and the desire to teach you the ins and outs of what you're investing in because what you don't, I, I have had to deal with clients who will get hung up on the day to day fluctuations of the stock market. And it, it, that's the last thing you want to do. You were investing for the long term. Uh, you should have a, a strategy. You, it, it, as an advisor, my belief is that you should have a strategy that you can explain to a six or seven year old. It shouldn't be overly complicated, it should be clear cut, very concise. And so, you know, get with someone that has a strategy that you know and understand. Because remember, it's it's your money. You're the boss. So whatever advisor, consult, consultant, so-called guru that's sitting, sitting in front of you, don't be afraid to ask questions. If you don't know what you don't know, it's your money. They work for you. They're there. They are there to serve you. Um, and so, yeah, so those are three things off the top of my head. Some of the basics in terms of how to get started um, if you're not currently investing. I, I think that answered the question. Did that answer yes, the question originally? 
Yes, sir. And Yolanda says, thanks, Eric. I love your quote, work, save, invest, and repeat. This is a very rich conversation. Thank you again. And yes, consistency is key. Very powerful. Now guys, you, I love this conversation in regards to strategies. Let's talk about the do's and don'ts. What are some of the do's and don'ts of investing in financial markets? That's an open question to both either one of you. <laughs> well, I, I, I would say, um, and Eric touched on this, um, you, you hear the term passive inve uh, investor or passive investment, right? There's nothing passive about your portfolio, right? Uh, even Warren Buffett says that he checks over a minimum of uh, two to three times a week and he has people to watch over his accounts. So you're never passively not checking into your portfolio, right? And the other thing that I, I would strongly say, and, and it goes along with a lot with what Eric says, is that you want to work with an advisor, but you want to be able, if you don't, um, if you have a question, then you have to be able to have an advisor that can answer your question in a way that you can understand it, right? Um, and then lastly, you know, you too have to do homework. You too have to understand what type of financial products that you have, how they work, what's your sequence of distributions, how, how much are you putting inside that account? Are you paying off debt enough so that you can put more inside that account? Is it growing for you? Is it, if it's not working for you, what contingency plans do you have? So I, I guess for me, there's not really any form of passive investment. You're always working towards that final goal. That's retirement and transferring wealth for like two to three generations. Very powerful. Thank you. James, anything you'd like to add, Eric? For sure, I'll, I'll I'll second that James comment about passive investing, especially with the financial markets. There is no there is no such thing as passive investing. Even if you own an index fund, and Wall Street tends to term that as a passive investment tool, there's some type of there's a a portfolio manager somewhere that's actively investing, managing that index fund. So there's, there's really nothing inherently passive about it, but definitely, you know, in regards to some do's and don'ts when it comes to investing in the stock market. Uh, again, I can't emphasize it enough. You know, don't, don't treat it like a, a casino. Uh, I, I don't prescribe day trading. If you look at the historical data, more than 90% of day traders uh, fail over the long term. Uh, so I, I don't prescribe that and uh, have a have a if you're going to invest in the financial markets, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I do with all my clients is we one of the first steps we go through one of the first exercises that we go through is we we build out their financial statement. And so a, a financial statement in the nutshell is a a spreadsheet that I, I built that's basically a combination of three things. It's a combination of your income statement, which the income statement lists out your your monthly income and it lists out your, your monthly expenses. Then it calculates your cash flow, which is your expenses minus your income. And then it also consists of the balance sheet, which consists of your assets and your liabilities. And then the third section of this financial statement is your net worth. So once you plug in all of your data, it automatically calculates your net worth at the bottom of it. And so, and, and that gives you a, a one page snapshot of your overall wealth. And I like to go, I like to go through the exercise with, cause I, I've been doing it personally for years. And now, you know, I, I use that tool with my clients and they, you know, find it to be very helpful. And then it lays out, you know, under the asset portion, you, your exposure that you have in the financial markets. And then the the benefit of having this tool in front of you, this financial statement, is that, you know, life changes all the time. You know, it's people move, they, they sell their home, they buy a new home. You know, they may sell a business at some point. And so uh, these these big financial events that take place to our, our lives drastically can change your overall financial picture. And then, you know, based on your financial picture, 
you can make adjustments in terms of your exposure in the financial market and your investment strategy in the financial market based on the current changes to your financial statement in accordance with your financial market investment strategy. So this is a continuous exercise that I do not only for my own personal wealth, but I do it with my clients as well. So those are a couple of the, the do's and don'ts that comes to mind when it comes to investing in uh, the financial markets. You know, Go right ahead, James. I can tell you something. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I'm listening to Eric, and it, it's so, you know, I, I want to commend you, brother, because your, your speech is just so logical and strategic. I love it. Um, I want to add into that. Um, so, yeah, he, he does pretty much the same process. I, you know, I use the financial GPS to calculate, you know, your income expenses and net worth. But then what, after that, um, you should be, you know, look at your savings and then look at your debt and then say, OK, this is what I'm going to be paying off in debt. Right. This is how much I have in debt, but this is how much I also have to invest. If you start working it that way, you should be pretty doggone good and then do everything uh, 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 Eric was just saying, life is going to be better. Life is going to be better just sticking there. Stay consistent. You should be good to go. Life is going to be good. Don't worry about it. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Um, and then the, the, the other thing, this is huge. As you're, as you're saving and as you're thinking about your investments, check out your local and federal tax laws, right? It's not what you earn, it's what you get to keep, right? So why build all that wealth and then you just got to hand it over, right? Um, you, you know, so, and then the, the other thing, don't do all of this and don't have a trust in a will. What are you, crazy? Right. They got a plan for your money. Right. You look at your state. They have a plan for your money if you don't have a trust in the will. OK. And I'm sure you don't want that to go to. Well, let's not go there. But, you, you know, be in control. <laughs> don't just own it, but be in control of what you own. Right. Um, and then my, my, my last thing, I'm really, really I'm a huge saver, but I'm real big on debt. Like, get rid of it. Let that be a part of your investment plan. Because the more you're able to pay off, the more you're able to stash away consistently over a period of time. Very powerful. Now, this question goes to both of you as well. I recently spoke with someone who said that they had financial anxiety. What are some steps an individual can take to get rid of that financial anxiety and actually handle their finances and get out of debt? Oh, that's you, James. Okay. <laughs> So I'm actually, I, I'm actually going to be doing a webinar, I think, in about three weeks. Um, it's behaviors and money, right? And many of our behaviors and money, you'll find out it comes from something that happened in your childhood. And most of it was pushed upon you in your childhood. You know, you go to the store and mom and say, no, don't you dare ask for anything when we go inside this store. Or you see dad stressed out because the bill is getting ready to come due. I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on my camera, but I'm going to keep going. I hope you can hear me. Look, yes, we can hear the anxiety, you. The anxiety of money comes from what you have absorbed from other people outside of yourself. You have absorbed this anxiety. That's bad energy. So let's. how do you get that good energy? Education. Right. It, you know, these webinars, they're fruitful. Right. Uh, reading the library. There's books and books inside the library. And I'm very I'm very proud of Bowie, Maryland. Right. Uh, a predominantly black area. I go into the library and all the kids got all the financial books checked out. Piss me off. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Made me angry. Right. But they're in there absorbing this knowledge. Why are you not absorbing this knowledge? Right. So education takes the edge away from anxiety, but application completely eliminates it. Very powerful. Thank you, James. And thank you, Eric. Is there any last comments that you all would like to leave with the audience before we wrap up here? You go for it, Eric. Take the first step. Uh, be the example. It, when, when you make it bigger than yourself in terms of investing with the mindset of generational wealth, it, it, it has much more meaning to it. It's about digging, pulling out your lineage. You know, I'm, I'm talking for a majority of the population out there. Most millionaires in this country are self-made. So take the first step, be the example, and keep the focal point on generational wealth. Make it bigger than yourself. Very inspiring. Thank you.
James? If your dreams, your hopes in with you, your dreams are too small, right? But if your dreams, your wealth, and your goals outlive you where people are talking about you two, three, and four generations from now, like the Rockefellers, like the Waltons, that, that's what we all should be aspiring to, right? Um, when we're talking about talking to somebody, vet people out. Many people don't understand that when you're talking to somebody in the financial markets or, 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 or financial advisor or, or, or planner, you, many times you have to engage them. So start engaging people. OK, don't everybody's not out to take your money. It's the most highly regulated uh, industry in, in the world. Everybody's watching my watching us, watching your money, reporting, all that good stuff. Reach out and start asking questions. Here's the other thing. If you're talking to somebody and getting financial advice and they're broke. That's bad information. Like if they haven't exhibited that to you. Right. Well, why are you having that conversation with them? Bring them along to somebody who understands the question, who can answer the question for you. And then lastly, the, the last thing is, uh, understand the power of trust and wills. Understand the power of not wanting to own something, but you want to control it, right? And and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really huge on, uh, guys, don't get married if you're going to get divorced. You're, you're ruining a lot of things generationally. If you're in it, you're in it to win it. And winning means that your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandkids are doing well because of the seeds that you planted. That's all I got for today. I love you guys. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, this is this is huge. Just like being on the same stage with Gigi and Doggo and Eric. Man, I'm so excited, man. I don't know what to do today, man. <laughs> Likewise, likewise, guys. And before we wrap up here, can you all tell the audience where they can find you? Sure, I'll go first. You can find me on social media platforms by just typing in Eric K. Hudson. Just type it in a search and I should pop up. You can also reach us through my website, which is hudson-wealth-management.com. Hudson-wealth-management.com. And then, of course, you can also shoot me an email directly at ehudson at hudson-wealth-management.com. Awesome. Thank you. And James? Um, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of things. So lasterfinancial.com, uh, the Laster Financial on Facebook, all about others on youtube that's where a lot of our webinars and trainings are posted um uh we're, we're also in, in a lot of other places linkedin you can just type in laster financial uh in google you should be able to find us uh but more importantly more importantly um podcasts like this uh we're doing pod, you know podcast after podcast is working with people uh one of the biggest things one of the biggest ways uh if you are a business owner is lasterfinancialgroup.com if your business is looking for some type of funding uh ppp loans or whatever you need help processing that so we have a lot of different avenues it just really depends on who you are what you're looking for absolutely amazing thank you james and thank you eric i appreciate you it's been a blast and i hope you all have a blessed day absolutely thank you so much Thank you, Regeline. You're welcome.